there are 76 million of us just here in the US. We are the biggest generation that ever existed. We were called the me ones, the crazy ones, and boy, do we know what that means, don't we? In fact, we have reinvented every single phase of our life. We were the yuppies, we were the hippies. We like innovation. Well, now we are in the winter of our life. And I can assure you, this is not going to be your average winter. I invite you to join me at Boomerology Reviews every single week so we can figure out how boomers are reshaping this phase of their lives. Join me. This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. Be independent with Standard.com. Hi. Hey, I'm Shahar. I'm Shahar Boyayan. I'm Shahar, your host. Shahar Boyayan, your host. And this is Boomerology Review. On this episode of Boomerology Review. Boomerology Review. Very cool stuff that you cannot miss. And a lot more for you to have fun. So let's watch. Let's watch. Are you proud to be a boomer or not? I, I am. I don't, I don't have a problem owning it. I had a girlfriend that when she hit 50, it was trauma. Oh, I'm like, girl, own it. Mm. it. It's a number. I feel better in my 50s now than I did in my 20s. Good. So yeah. When I was getting ready to turn 50, I knew it's kind of the same mindset. I'm not sure how I'm feeling about that. <laughs> so I created a Red Hat Society. I can't say that I'm not proud of it, but I'm kind of... Um, I'm at the very tail end of the boomers, so I always find that I put that disclaimer when people, you know, when they say that, you know, 1964 is the last year, I'm like, well, I'm just the very tail end, you know, my parents have waited December. for me. So here for you is Mary. Mary is a Y generation, and she's very happy with her life, but she does feel a little depressed. And why? That's what we are going to see today. Baby boomers, as we know, are people born between 1946 and 1964. Some studies have shown that boomers actually deal with stress a lot better than millennials, for example. We are more flexible, maybe just because of the fact that we learn how to go with the flow. The U.S. Census Bureau projects that by 2020, uh, those 65-year-olds will be 16% of the population. Today, they are 13% of the population, so we are aging as a, as a society. By 2030, one out of every five Americans will be 65 or older. Mary, of course, has boomers' parents. And they were raised by their parents from the great generation. Well, their parents, they have faced the Great Depression. So they always worried about security and being prosperous in life. So they told their kids, hey kids, you know what? You have to work very hard. If you work hard, you are going to have security and prosperity. So don't forget, work hard. Oh, grandpa is not doing very well lately. We, boomers, cross all over the board. We buy the cool stuff, we buy gadgets, we go to Starbucks, and we consume a lot more. We are on a moment in our lives where we have disposable income to spend. But it looks like when it comes to companies and to, to advertisers, we just don't exist. They put everybody in the old bucket. You know, it's interesting to see that because next year, the first person to turn 50 will be a Gen X. So what, what are we going to say? Gen Xers are old too? At the beginning, they went through their hippie years, but after they were over with that, they went, they went after careers. And they found out that not only they could become prosperous, they could become even more prosperous than they ever dreamt about. That was a big deal for them. They became very optimistic. Gee, 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 gee. So they told their kids, the Y generation, hey, Mary, you can be whatever you want. You have the power. You're so fantastic. You can get anything in life. Are you guys proud of being a boomer or not? Of course. Well, yeah. Yeah? Proud of being the crazy ones. The crazy ones. <laughs> <laughs> proud that we're still here. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm proud to be a boomer on this side of the grass. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> that's, uh, many are not so fortunate. <laughs> they were very optimistic about Mary, and Mary believed them. So she started to think, I am special. I can get whatever I want. I can even get more than my own parents, because after all, I don't want just prosperity and a green lawn. I want a lawn full of flowers and with my own unicorn because I'm special. 
think is very healthy sometimes for we really to go back to our past and see the things we were grateful for where we had a lot of fun you know and just share that with people we live in a world today that we have so many options so many toys out there so many gadgets to buy all the time but you know many times they become meaningless because they're, they're just more stuff true multitasking that is doing more than one thing simultaneously is a myth as our brains are actually switching from one task to the other really really fast one thing i used to love when i was very young was to read comics i really it was my passion actually my father when he had to ground me that's what he would do not give me money for my comics i had a bunch of them so when i was young i was crazy for comic books i would go all the time actually i would beg my mother and my father to take me to a newsstand that's where they were sold to get me some comic books we are going to visit a chocolate exhibit it's really really fun we are going to learn a lot about chocolate and I hope they have some samples. Today we are visiting a cookie convention. Yes, like in sugar cookies. Never heard of them before, but I know they're becoming very, very popular. Today, I'm here at Comic Con in Salt Lake City. They have 100,000 people attending. It's a, comics today are also a huge part of this generation of the pop culture, just like it, it, they were in our time. Um, you know, a lot of heroes were created by boomers, and it's so cool to see how this generation now really likes and enjoys. It's fantastic, and I'm going to show you about the show and about the artists in here. Let's watch. So I met this cutie pie here. How you doing? Yes. He told me there are some very fun things to do here at Comic Con, right? Yeah. And I think he will invite me to go on a date. What do you see that is different in the industry comparing 35 years ago to now? Well, nowadays, most of the work is all done overseas, so there's not a whole lot of studios left in the U.S. Uh, when I started, there were six major TV studios. Within three years, there was one. Then I got into directing and directed things like King of the Hill, uh, Duckman, and a bunch of other TV series as well. And now, of course, everything's done on computer. And uh, I was on the ground floor of the computer stuff as well, but... I like to draw, you know, so it, it wasn't as much fun to do it with the computer. In the last year, um, it feels like it has just kind of exploded. It, it feels like cookies are going to be the next cupcake. I'm here with Julia Usher, and I have to tell you, every single person I talk about cookies, they say you're the queen of cookies. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. That's just immensely honoring to have heard that said. So, Tell me how you got started with cookies. I actually got started by cookies in cookies by doing cakes. I had a cake bakery for about 10 years in St. Louis, Missouri, which is my hometown, and I always did cookies as kind of a sideline. It wasn't until I closed my bakery and I wrote a book, which happened to be about cookies, that I got really deeply entrenched in the cookie world. My books kind of took me much further into cookies than I ever envisioned. Did you know that animals actually help plant cacao trees? It's very important for us always to be aware of wildlife and their importance in our society and in our food. For example, with chocolate or with the cacao, they like to eat the cacao pod, so they break with the beak to eat the pulp inside. But the seeds are very, very bitter, so they don't like that, and they throw around, and therefore you get new cacao trees. You have a long history with chocolate, right? We do, it's been uh, passed down since Steve's grandmother. Basically. Oh, so it wasn't your family. You know, it, it, chocolate's always been in my family. Like, my grandmother dipped chocolates her whole life, and she learned when she was 13 years old 
she actually learned um, it was a place called Lindsay's um, Candies. It's long, you know, it's it's been out of business. But she actually taught my family how to do chocolates, and they did it as a hobby. And about 11 years ago, Kate and I we all we opened up a shop in the avenues. We've got different um, ingredients yes. that we add to it. It's all we have our pure, so it's 70 percent. Then we add. Um, we have a hot mole, a salt, espresso, a tart cherry, a ginger, and a, an orange peel bar. Delicious. I really like the pure. Can you tell me about your system? I am starting at the beginning, and I'm sampling the different ones and marking the ones that I prefer. And then when I'm through sampling, I'm going to purchase. Where uh, the grains, uh, the beans come from? So currently we, uh, we have a Madagascar. We have uh, a Venezuela Canawabo. We have uh, Bolivia Palos Blancos, and we have a uh, Uganda Bundabugyo. <laughs> Hi, I'm here with Audrey Lilo, right? With Icing Smiles. Tell me about this organization. Um, Icing Smiles was formed a little bit uh, over three years ago, so. And we donate cakes to critically and terminally ill children and their siblings. Cakes are our mo main focus, but we also have a little secret, which is our cookie club. And if we're following our families that we served with cakes and notice that the kids are having a difficult time with their treatments, um, such as, you know, a cancer treatment, just having a really hard time, then we want to send them a little pick-me-up in the mail. And so we extend a call to one of our sugar angels, all our volunteers are called sugar angels, and ask them if they might send a dozen cookies in the mail, just kind of as a pick-me-up. And the families always appreciate it because sometimes they feel kind of forgotten um, going through all of what they go through. And it's just um, a nice little bright spot in their world. I got my weapons, now let's get started. Okay, this is the result of my first try. You know, it might not be a work of art, but it was really fun to make. Now, I kind of think I don't have a bright future with cook decoration, so let's take a look of what the other people are doing. How long have you been making cookies? I've been making cookies most of my life, but I didn't start getting this interested in it until about three years ago. It's okay. It's kind of my night job. I'm brand new to this, so uh, this is my first fondant cookie. Like a nine months, but I'm an art teacher, and all my life I've been in oil paint. Less than two years, really. It's uh, I think it's uh, a skill that comes on quickly, mm -hmm. and you get better quickly, and then you kind of hit a wall. <laughs> It did, it did. Years of practice. So you're one of the founders of reality TV. Yeah. Because <laughs> of course the Monkees were, were a traditional band that got together in someone's garage and grew yeah. up until eventually they had their own reality TV show, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's funny actually some people think that is, is what happened. I still get people that, that come up and say, so what was it like when you guys got your TV show? For those of you that don't know what we're talking about, it was, it was, uh, they were put together and cast in a show. It was, it was a, it was a scripted show, right? So is most modern reality television. Uh, it wasn't, a, it was a reality show. It was a sitcom, a, a typical of the time. And the thing that was unique about it was that they, had, they clearly wanted it to be uh, us to play and sing, because you had to, you had to. Um, uh, act, you had to sing, you had to play an instrument. I played uh, guitar at the time, I played Johnny Be Good was my audition piece. And so they clearly had the idea that it was going to go. You know the closest thing that's come along since then that I think is, is sort of similar uh, in that sense is uh, Glee. And The Monkees was a television show about an imaginary band that lived in that beach house, and I, to this day, I cannot figure out how this out-of-work band, <laughs> we never got a job and we had a beach house in Malibu. Wow! <laughs> how did that happen? Uh, but then clearly it, it, it went on and it became, you know, the whole became greater than the sum of its parts. 
and we did go on the road, and we're still going on the road, that I'm late. I can... oh, no. The very first thing I would like to know is really your secrets to be able to predict trends. Predicting trend is not that difficult. Most people get very, um, uh, very confused, or at least they don't see what I see, because of course they see that everything is linear. In reality, everything is um, everything is like a circle. Everything is like in the Lion King. They talk about the circle of life. I mean, there's always patterns. In fact, the word century comes from from uh, Latin, which is a cycle, which is basically a circle. And everything has to be a circle, so there's always patterns. What's cool on Disney World for boomers? You know, many times I know we go with our grandchildren there, but what else is there for us? If it's just adults, there's a lot of uh, options for just adults uh, looking for uh, fun things to do. First of all, in my opinion, doing anything at Disney World as adults, as my wife and I like to experience, uh, is fine. I mean, you can still ride all the same great attractions. You can still interact with all of the characters, it's still fun, uh, and it does bring out the kid in you. Now, about your book, Who Moved My Dentures, I actually, when I saw this, I saw on Google Plus the first time, I said, what a clever title, right? Uh, tell me about this book, How, why did you decide to write that book, and what's in it? In terms of the title, essentially I just kind of came up with that. I don't know, it was just one day it popped out. But then I actually backed into a logical reason why that book actually makes sense. Uh, because if you know the, the, the cheese book, you know, the Who Moved My Cheese, mm -hmm. it's about resiliency in the workplace, right? And it's if something happens, how do you rebound, that kind of thing. Well, this book's about the same thing, if you really think about it. It's mm -hmm. about elders who at one point in, in their life faced a choice. They couldn't live perhaps independently anymore and they needed to go into uh, some kind of advanced type of care. You know, there are many benefits of having positive thoughts. One of them is every time you're thinking about something good, you're creating images in your brain. You know, we met the other day at an event and you were talking to me about really how the stuff we have inside our heads actually affect a lot our body. A lot of things that happen in our body are subconscious. I mean, your body runs subconscious. You don't have to tell your heart beat, beat, beat. Mm -hmm. It's all happening, you know, from the subconscious control. And what's also in the subconscious is memory. So when things happen to us, it can be triggered again, even if it's inappropriate for that time. Say you have a sports injury that's very violent, but there were some emotions with that. It can get triggered again by something much less um, violent, but you can still bring up those symptoms again. The physical symptoms? Yeah, the physical symptoms. So what you're telling me is, uh, let's suppose I had some type of trauma when I was a very young girl. Mm -hmm. I could still trigger all those feelings and physical reactions yes, today? exactly. Like having the responses um, that should be reserved for only extreme times. Most people are in defense way too much. Um, and we let ourselves do that, especially from memory as well. Even where in moments that we are not in any danger, yeah, right? Like, like right working. now. Like right like now. Right now. now I'm, we are in I'm scared danger. to be camera. on film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shahar, first of all, let me say I love your show. Oh, thank the you. Boomer Revealed. <laughs> and uh, about me, I'm a clinical herbalist. I am trained in herbs of all sorts. Mm -hmm. So I actually am a clinician, a practitioner. People consult with me for their health concerns, okay. and I have an extensive herbal pharmacy. And uh, I love to help people understand how to use herbs safely and appropriately in their diet and health care. Awesome. And today, we're just going to talk about diet because I brought in some early spring herbs. Oh, nice. And since it's so early in the spring mm -hmm. here, I want people to know that some of your herbs come up this early, e even in April and early May. Can I grab one leaf? Sure. To see? Yeah. Taste it. Tell me what you think. Mmm. Can I make tea out of this? You can nice. make it. It's probably really good for your digestion. I have never also tried that before. Super high in potassium. Mm. But how's the flavor to you? Is it just? I like it. I'm all about real food. I think we always yeah. should favor, you know, things from the ground that we can eat, other than anything we can buy out there. So it's really good to experiment. Exercise after 50 is a wonderful way to ward off depression because you're building those endorphins, you're releasing. Um, 
uh, stress hormones throughout the day, doing work, chasing the grandkids, you know, just a whole variety of things. And we have a tendency in this culture to underestimate the effects of stress. So it's really important that exercise burn those things up. Some people believe um, that if they exercise an hour a day, that makes them healthier. And what research is currently showing is that's not necessarily true. So for someone like me who has always hated to exercise, that is great news. What the research is now showing um, is intensity means a great deal. You can do shorter exercise periods, 15, 20 minutes, but if you do interval training, high intensity with the large muscles, so you're maybe doing an elliptical, doing a bicycle, climbing some stairs, not my favorite. Most of us have some knees that we have to, you know, pay attention to. Whatever you find interesting, just rev up the intensity for about two minutes and then slow down and do your pacing again. If you do that about eight to 10 repetitions, not only do you get great endurance over time, but it also trains that heart muscle. And you remember we always tell the men not to go out and shovel snow in the winter because they're doing these explosive movements and they're holding their breath and that's what creates the situation for the heart attack. Very, very simple to use. I only have to put the window down and clip the thing, right? And adjust to my height. And I have something that is very resistant and I can use to get out of the car. Footmate system is really great, especially if you have diabetes, arthritis, you're a pregnant mother ha having a hard time reaching your feet. And of course, athletes that need to take that odor out. You can find Footmate at footmate.com. The other problem with this lever is having to be up when you go up is that if you have a big butt, you also have an issue here, right? Because then you don't have enough room for yourself. So take care of about these details before you decide to make a purchase. I actually have two of them for real in my living room. It stays on each side of my couch and I use it every single night. I really love. It's the assisted tray by standard.com. So go take a look at standard security pole. Here's the solution for you. There is a portable toilet. This one is called Happy. It's my Fitbit. So one thing that we found was the bad caddy by standard. Don't forget to get for yourself a Metro Travel bed cane from standard. The reason I have those facts for you, first is nice trivia. Second, if you're a baby boomer, you can boast about it yourself. And if you're younger, you get to understand us. Like the other day, I saw a, tw a tweet of a guy saying that uh, boomers had had I destroyed the society or something like that and, and between parentheses he put generation x and guess what generation x is not a baby boomer it's a different generation it came after the baby boomers and i see that quite often so people are complaining about the boomers and complaining how we left all this mass but they don't even know who baby boomers are it looks like we fit all in one bucket old and many times like in some websites we don't even have an age group anymore what's going on do they think that boomers don't spend money? Let me give you some hard facts. Numbers by AARP. Did you know that the boomers spend an average of $31 trillion every single year? Yes, and it looks like everything now is about advertising to millennials. Well, millennials spend an average of $800 billion a year. See the difference? Millennials, $800 billion. Boomers, 31 trillion. We are the biggest buying market out there and we like creative things, not really couples in separate bathtubs in the middle of nowhere holding hands. So get to know us a little bit better because you can sell a lot more. I hope you enjoyed the show this week. If you did, don't forget to share, thumbs up, rate our channel. These are the type of things that keep us going. And I'll meet you next week at Boomerology Revealed. This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. Be independent with Standard.com.